Okay, today what I'm gonna explain, I'm gonna continue talking about torsional system, but we're gonna talk about indeterminate system. So I think I think most of you will gonna will catch up or like imagine how we're gonna conclude this equation because it's very similar to what we did with the axial systems. Okay? So today we have two indeterminate systems. We have members in series and we have coaxial members. So we have this type and we have that type. Okay? Similar to what we did with the axial system, but now and instead of dealing with axial forces, we're gonna deal with torsion or moment about z. Okay? So basically, why why is this system is indeterminate? So this question you should ask yourself first before solving the problem. So I do have an applied torsion here, which is like external force. Can you get like what each value gonna be? Because you'll have an unknown here and you'll have another unknown there, which is the reaction to this torsion, right? So you will have an unknown here, an unknown here, okay? So what do you have here? You have applied torsion this way, which is kinda counterclockwise, so to counteract this force, I need this torsion, I need a clockwise moments at the supports. Do you all agree with me? But now I do have only one, I do have two unknowns, and I only have one equation to solve this, which is like I will take some mission torsion at any point, but if I took this equation, I, I can't find the two unknowns. So that's, that's why it's indeterminate. So how can we solve this type of problems? Again, we need one extra equation. And this one extra equation, we're going to get it from the compatibility equation, which is our understanding of how the system is gonna, gonna deform. Okay? So let's start first. Same to what we did before. Whenever we have this type of members in series, what we want to do, we want to locate where is the applied force or applied torque, which was here in the middle. So whether the, the, the torque going to be applied somewhere in the middle like this, or we're going to put a plate. I mean, in both cases, we need a plate. So that, I mean, like, there's, there's nothing, there is no force like this. I mean, like, we need to apply a plate. And this plate, there is, like, a wrench that's coming from outside, and that's how we apply the torsion. But instead of being the question big, so we just, like, we just put the, this, tor th this torque, okay? So whenever you see the torque, like this, or whenever you see the plate, take this plate out. So when we take this plate out, we need to cut at member two and member one. So as if we were making this box, and we're just taking this box out. Same to that one, okay? So we have two approaches here. So the first approach for the equilibrium equation, and feel free to use any of them, the first one here, which is similar to what we did before. I do have a plate. And then I do have, for example, let's <coughs> cut in this member, for example, member two. And I do have cut in member one. The second part is I want you to convert this form of torque to the other form of the torque, which is the double arrowed force. So which direction will this one I will put here, whether to the right or to the left? To the right. Using the right hand rule, make your fingers follow the moment. So my thumb pointing that way, which is this way. So now I do have the external torque pointing that way. I will call it T, for example. Okay? And then I will assume that the torques are twisting out from both of member two. So T2, and then it's twisting out from T1, okay? As if it's a tension, but it's not a tension. As we agreed before, this is like we are twisting out. It's not like we are not tightening it in. We are assuming it's twisting out. Again, it's an assumption. What's that? My bad. I should put double arrow. So whenever we have torque, you need to put double arrow to differentiate between them. So now I'm twisting them out. So what I want to do, I want to take summation torque at any point. <coughs> summation torque, moment about z, 
or torque at any point will equal to zero. So before I continue this equation, I want to relate to what we did before. What we did before in the first lecture on statics, if we do have a fixed beam like this, and we do have all these kind of forces, and in 3D, it's going to be something like this. So this is the beam, and this is the fixation, and the fixation comes here in the form of a column, okay? And I do have all these forces which align with those forces. It's, sim it's, it's, it's the same system, but here in 3D and here in 2D. What we did before, if we want to find, for example, the reactions, I would take, in this example, in this 2D, I will take, for example, summation moment about A equal to zero. But by default, what we did before, and what we what they did before, we took the moment of the forces and the summation of the moment about this point, but about which axis? What is this force times the distance rotating about which axis? So we have x, we have z, and we have y. Before, we used to take summation moment about a, but notice that all the forces are rotating about which axis? The x-axis. So by default, what we did before, we didn't write this because it's obvious that the summation moment about the x-axis. What are we going to do today? And instead of taking the summation moment about the x-axis, we are interested in torsion now. So we are going to take the summation moment, I mean, in case, in this example now, if we have these torques, and I want to find the reaction here, for example, now, in which axis should I take the moment about, the summation moment about? So I'll take, for example, also the summation moment about that point, but about which axis? About z, that's correct. So now we are changing the axis. So it is similar to what we did before, but we just added an extra dimension here, which is the z axis. Also, remember in, in statics or in the first lecture, when I took the summation about that point, about x axis, about point A, a reaction AY got canceled because there is no distance to multiply AY with. But the moment A got canceled or no? No, because it's already multiplied by a distance, so it will be also present in the equation. So now, related to the torsion equation, if I took a moment at any point in that beam, all the torsion is going to be applied because they are already multiplied by a distance. Returning to the first equation here, the point that I want to make, it, is, it doesn't matter where, which point here that I want to take the torsion about because all are these forces, or like all these torques, because these are torques, these are not forces, going to be present in the equation. So what I'm proposing here is, if I took summation moment about z or torque equals zero, what I want to do, I want to say T, which is this applied torque, plus T2, because they are both in the same direction, minus T1 is equal to zero. As if we are taking the summation Fx equal to zero. As if, but it's not summation Fx, it's summation torque. And you need to look at this from like a different dimension. I hope it's clear. Okay? So now this will be our equilibrium equation, this is using the method of the cut, which I prefer in this case. But you are free to assume that we do have a reaction here, which, which makes sense. If I do have an applied torsion that is counterclockwise, what do you think our reaction going to be? In which direction? Clockwise. So what you can do, you can say torque A and torque B, and again, also to take the summation of the torque at any point equal to zero. And then what do we have here? We have TA plus TB because they are both in the same direction minus the applied torque equal to zero. The, the, the equation, they're not the same. So in this one, in the first one, we assume that everything is twisting out. If we were wrong, we would get a negative, okay? And if we get a negative, that means everything like going to twist in because we assume everything in positive, which everything going to twist out. But this assumption needs to be careful because 
is this TB twisting in or out? That twisting in. And when we look at one end, remember, we are relating it to the other end. So if we got positive here, that means, bless you, if we got positive here, that means we are twisting in. What about if we got positive here? No, we're not twisting in, we're twisting out, right? So you need to be careful with your assumption. Here, I mean, now I think we are in lecture eight, so I'm pretty sure that you're gonna catch, like you're gonna respect your assumption, which means if one is positive, I mean like TB is positive, that means it's, it's twisting in. So it's, it's like a negative, okay? So this you need to be a little bit careful, careful when to interpret your to interpret your output. But this one is like I'm assuming everything in positive. I'm assuming everything is twisting out. So if I got positive, I'm okay. Everything is twisting out. If I got negative, by default it's twisting in. But here, if you got positive in TB, for example, that's twisting in. That's not twisting out. Is that clear? So this one I would say be a little bit careful when you assume this assumption to follow up or to respect your assumption, okay? This one is like, you are safe. You are assuming everything in tension. If it's tension, okay. If it's not, then it's twisting in, okay? So the compatibility equation, let me, let me show it to you, and you will tell me how they are gonna rotate. I do have different member, and applying a torsion here in the middle. When I apply a torsion here, I'm applying this way. Do you think that both of them are rotating with the same magnitude or no? Like the same angle of twist? No, they are. Look. They are rotating the same, but that doesn't mean that they are feeling the same torque. Do you agree with me? I'm rotating in the middle. I'm rotating the same. So I'm forcing the rotation to be the same, but that doesn't mean that they are feeling the same torque. It depends on how strength they are, because if you remember, we have the G in the equation, which is the function of the material. So when I force the same torque on both of them, I'm forcing same, ro same rotation. So you, you can apply it. I mean, you can see how they are rotating the same, right? So the angle here, the angle of twist are the same, but so if this is the beam from like elevation view, and here is the plate in the middle, when I apply a torque, at the beginning, I used to have a straight line like this. But when I apply the torque from one side, I have this. At the end, of course, it's going to be zero because I don't have any rotation here. It's a fixation. And from the other side, I would have it is starting from here because they're both rotated the same, and it will end up with zero, like this. This will be how it's going to rotate. Do you see it? Do you all can imagine this or no? Anyone disagrees? Okay. So let's take a cross section here and here and see what is the relation. So now we agreed that they have the same angle of twist. But are they in the same direction? Let's see. So if I have a cross section like this from here, this is point A. It rotated to A star, right? If it rotated to a star, that means it's rotated that way, right? So if I applied this rotation, so my finger will be pointing inside, right? So I do have this one from that side. So let's look at the other side, what happened. So from the other side, I do have, this is point A and it went to point A star like this, and it rotated that way. Right or wrong? So this section for that segment, this one from that segment, as if like you're looking that way, so it's rotating like that, and I'm looking for from here, and it's rotating like that. Do you all see it? Okay, so if it's rotating like that, where is my hand pointing, my thumb is pointing? Outwards, right? So what is the relation now between these two angles? Are they the same sign or they are different sign? Are they rotating 
So this one is rotating that way. So different sign means this one is rotating counterclockwise. This one is rotating what? Clockwise. So what I will propose here that I will say that angle of twist one is equal to negative angle of twist two. Do you all agree? So it is rotating that way, right? What is my thumb pointing? Don't use the left. Don't use the left hand. Oh, you're still using the right? But, but you see, I want to adjust my fingers to follow the bending moment. OK, forgot about the bending moment. But you agree with me it's rotating that way, right? Clockwise or counterclockwise? Oh, this is like in 3D. I'm drawing it 3D. But again, forget about the moment. Is, it, is the rotation here clockwise or counterclockwise? Clockwise. What about that one? Clockwise. So they are different, right? You still can't see it? No. You still? OK. So the first one, I will have my finger follow the bending moment. So my thumb where is pointing? Inside. This one, I will have my finger follow the bending moment. Where is my thumb pointing? Outside the section. I'm, I'm relating here to the section, which is to this beam, this segment. Still? So anyone? Anyone disagrees? OK, I, I I'll explain to you after the lecture, OK? So we do have that the angle of twist 1 is equal to negative angle of twist 2, OK? Which is similar to what we did before. I prepared a tab table here, which compares the members in series when we did have deltas, and now when we have a rotation. So when I said angle of twist 1 is equal, equal negative angle of twist 2, which means 1 plus 2 is equal to 0, right? So from now on, we already explained the members in series when it comes to delta. And we all agreed that delta 1 was equal to negative delta 2. But let's put that way so that we can have some sort of consistency in, in assuming our deltas and the phi's or the phi's. So delta 1 plus delta 2 was equal to 0 in the members of series. And now, when we have torsion, we can say phi 1 plus phi 2 is equal to 0. And another explanation to this, so I explained it in the way that the rotation are in different sign. So there is another explanation, explanation in the book which tells you you remember the assumption that we said at the beginning, and so assumption, it's a fact. If I want to find, if I added phi1 plus phi2, what does that give me? The total rotation at here, right? What is the total rotation at here? Zero. So the, the book uses this way of explanation, which is, I know at the end it's going to be zero. So I will assume rotation1 plus rotation2 should equal to zero. And that's also another explanation to this. What do you mean? Like, uh, the direction yeah, because, because, for example, if I said phi 1, because the whole thing is equal to 0, so you can multiply by a negative. OK? So same assumption here if you have not only one applied torque. If you have two applied torque and you have three segments, we know at the end it's going to be equal to 0. So I can say phi 1 plus phi 2 plus phi 3 equal to 0. And that's only for members in series. So here is like two explanation of how you can come up with this assumption. OK? If the first explanation didn't get it, then use that one with the assumption that the rotation is like cumulative at the end. So 1 plus 2 should equal to 0, because at the end, I do have 0 rotation. Is that clear? OK. Let's move to the other one, the other system, when we, we have coaxial members. And coaxial members also, when we have two members, their axes or their axes coincide on each other. So now, and instead of having them in series, now I'm putting them inside each other, for example. And I apply a rotation. What do you think? What's happening? Are they equal or no? So they're equal in magnitude. What about the direction? They're also equal in direction. So our assumption here will be, let me talk about the compatibility one. 
I will say phi 1 is equal to phi 2. OK? And then the equilibrium equation, same as to what we did before. So here what we did before, was it here? No, it wasn't here. It was in lecture 5. Here, for example, same to what we have in lecture 5, we will cut anywhere within the beam span. So this is the same to what we, we will do here. I'm going to make my cut any way in the middle. And we also have here two approaches. But before, before explaining this, I want to explain why is this system indeterminate. Although I do have one end, but the thing is, I do have two different materials here. So at the support, I will not only have one reaction, I will have two reactions. I will have one reaction for brass, which is the, the material in the middle, and I do have one other um, I do have other unknown here for the steel. So now I do have two unknowns, and with these two unknowns, and I do have one equation, so that's why it's indeterminate. And you're going to take your cut. So we have also here two approaches. And I prefer the first one, which is the cut method, because it gives me everything in positive. So it's easy for me to interpret the output. So I'll take the cut in the middle, and I'll be working with that side. So what I do have, I do have OK, and this is the, 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 the cut I have. And then I do have the 250, for example, pound foot. And I do have, OK, instead of putting it this way, let's be consistent. It's going to be pointing outside, right, the 250? Do you all agree? Do you agree with that? It's pointing. Where is the 250 pointing? Outside. So I do have the T brass, and then I do have the T steel. Again, summation torque at any point should equal to 0. And then I'll add T steel plus T brass minus 250 is equal to 0. And I move minus to the other side, which is equal to 250. And here is the equilibrium equation. Is that clear? All good? OK. What is the other approach? As if we want to solve without cuts, we want to solve for the reaction. We want to take the reaction. So we're going to, we, as if we, we're not going to make a cut, but we're going to take the summation torque at any point for the whole beam. It's going to be the same. So my assumption here is that I do have um, counterclockwise applied torque, so I'm expecting the reaction should be in clockwise to just counteract this. So I will say the second approach, summation torque at any point is equal to zero, and I will say T steel plus T brass is equal to 250. Same equation, same assumption. OK? And the, the, the following process is going to be the same to what we did before. Just break up this equation, the phi1, which is TL over JG. And so you will have T1 and I have T2 here. And then you have T1 and T2 here. So you have now two equations with two unknowns. A summary also to what the coaxial system used to be. So in the axial system, when we, when we had delta, we said delta 1 was equal to delta 2. And now, when we do have um, torsion, phi 1 is equal to phi 2. I wrote here, for gaps, you need to analyze it. Because that's what we did before. If we have coaxial member, you need to see which one is expanding, similar to what we did before. Here we had 2 is expanding. And it's going to take gap and phi 1 with it. So we, we, we already concluded that equation before. So whenever there is a gap, you need to further 
analyze it. Is that clear? OK, let's solve an example for this. It is similar to homework example. So what we have, we have two material. We have applied torque. The question asks us, plot the shear stress distribution acting along a radial line of this cross section. OK? So let's, let's, let's um, solve it the way that what we did before by getting first the torsion in the two material. And then we can worry later about drawing the shear stress distribution. So let's start by writing the equilibrium equation. It is same to the one that we concluded earlier. So I will take that one here. I will copy that one. And I'll put it here. OK, and here's the first equation. The second equation, I will say phi1 is equal to phi2. So let's break up this equation. So I have phi1, which is t1, l1, j1, g1. And then same as T2. What do you notice about the length? The lengths are the same, right? So I can cancel length 1 with L length 2 because they are the same. OK? And now just solve it similar to what we did before. So I do have T1. But I'm naming here T1. Let's, let me name it steel instead, steel and, and brass. Steel, brass, brass, brass. So I will put this one in terms of T steel. I will have 250 minus T brass. And this is the first equation. And I'm going to substitute, instead of T steel here, I'm going to go put 250 minus the torque of brass. So I will say 250 minus T brass over the J4 steel. So look, steel now is considered to be hollow because the steel was in the outer part and the inside was brass. So as if I'm going to remove the brass and I will find the J for the steel because J is found for the material, OK? So now I will assume as if the steel is hollow, and I will get the J for the steel, which is, if you remember from yesterday, pi over 32, the outer diameter. So what I see here, I have the radius of 1 for the steel. So the diameter is 2 to the power 4 minus the inner diameter. So the radius of the inner is 0 0.5, so the diameter is 1. So 1 power 4. And then G, the G steel is 11.4 times 10 power 3. Take care of the units because it's given here that the G is in KSI and the 250 here is pound inch. So I have kilo pounds down here and I have pounds at the top. So I can multiply here by thousand. So I convert from kilo pounds to pounds. So I will say multiply by 1,000. The other side, I do have T brass. And then brass is considered now to be solid, because that's the middle part. So the J for that is pi 32 times the diameter of the middle part, which is 1 power 4, times 5.2 times 10 power 3 times 1,000. Is that clear to everyone? Any questions so far? OK, I highly recommend that you put this thing in your calculator. And I don't want you to do any math. So if you plug that in, you're going to find T brass equal to 88.53 pound inch. And if I multiply this by 12, I'm going to get 7.37 pound foot. 
okay? Substituting in equation one, what I'm gonna get, I'm gonna get T steel is equal to 242 pound foot, okay? How I got those numbers? Calculator. No, I, 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 there's, I don't want you to waste your time in any math solving here, okay? So now, the second part is, I want to draw the shear stress distribution. So remember from the last lecture, we're going to use the equation that relates the torque to the radial distance, which is here, for example. Let me, let me first show you what we are drawing. So what we are drawing, we want to draw the stress distribution within the cross section. So I took this cross section out. And as if we do have x-axis, and I do have y-axis, OK? And the x here represent, so x here, so at x equals 0, as if we are saying at rho equals 0. I think it makes sense if instead of having x and y-axis, I would have rho and the y here is the shear stress. I think that makes more sense, OK? So at rho equals 0, without solving anything, what is the stress in here? It should be 0. And I should expect that the stresses at this point, which is the, the, like, the furthest point in the brass, should be the highest in the brass. And the furthest point in the steel should be, highest, should be the highest stress. So let, let us prove that. So I will start first in this region. In this region, I do have brass. So I will say, for the brass part, I will say tau, which is shear stress, for the brass at rho equal to 0. I know that you all mentioned it's going to be 0, but let's write the equation. So the equation is T rho over J. But since rho is 0, so the whole equation is going to be the 0. So I want to plot that in here. So I'm going to put 0 here, for example. Do I need to calculate the rho at each point here? No, because the relation is linear. So I'm OK with calculating the, the stress at the first point, at the middle, and at the end. So what is, what is the, OK, let me write the radiuses here. So for the brass, I have 0.5 radius. And for the steel, I do have 1 inches. So what do you think the next row should be? At row equal what? That's correct. So I'll find T brass at row is equal to 0.5 inches. So the T that I'm going to substitute in here is the T brass, not the T steel, because I'm still in the region of the brass. So what was the T brass equal? It was 7.37 pound foot multiplied by 12 to convert it to inches. I already have it 88, but let me just for completeness. And then the rho here is going to be 0.5 inches over j, which is pi over 32, 1 power 4. I got 450 pound inch square. How I'm going to plot that in there? So at this value, at radius is equal to 0.5, I want to go up by 450. OK? So as if I do have a scaled y-axis here or t-axis, but I, don't have, I didn't need to have it scaled as long as it's reasonably scaled. And with reasonably scaled here, I mean, if you have 450, show me that 450 is higher, th for example, than 100. I don't want to be scaled, but at least it's like reasonably scaled. I will show you that in a moment. So at the end here, I do have 450. And that's the shear stress distribution in the brass. Now let's move. So I'm, I want to write here shear stress distribution which is the name of this diagram. And the unit here is pound inch square. So let's move to the other region, which is steel. 
So at tau steel, so shear stress of steel, at rho equal to what? What do you all think? Where should I start? Should I start at rho equal zero? Where, where is the, the where is the steel starts? At rho equal what? 0.5. Do you all agree with him? That's correct. So at rho equal 0 0.5, I want to find the T steel. So the T steel, I found it to be 242 times 12 times the rho, which is 0 0.5 over pi over 32, 2 power 4 minus 1 power 4. Right? I got 985. So at that point, I want you to go up to 985. And with reasonably scaled here, I do have 450. So I need to see that 950 is higher than the 450. OK? So I'm going to go up here to 985. And this is the first stress of the steel. What about the last point? I don't, again, I don't need to calculate any points in the middle because the relation here is equal. The tau is directly proportional to rho. That means it's like, it's like a straight line. So since it's a straight line, I want to calculate the stress at the beginning and at the end. So at the end, what is the rho equal? So tau steel at rho is equal to 1. The same equation, same equation. So I don't want you to write the equation all the time. I want you to save it once in the calculation in case we have a lot of points. And what you're going to change every time is the value of rho. So what I'm going to do, I'm going to copy this equation. And instead of 0.5 inches, I want to say 1 inch. Do you all agree why it's one inch? Because from here, I want to calculate the, the shear at the end. And, and here, it is one inch. So what I got, I got 1971 pound inch square. So at the end here, I want to go up 1971. And I will have a straight line like this. And this is the stress distribution for this cross section. And how can you read it? If I ask you what is the stress in here, what you want to do, you want to read this height. What is the stress here, you want to read that height. OK? So now it does make sense. At the end of the brass, you have the highest stress in the brass. And the end of the steel, you have the highest stress in the steel and high stress of the cross section, which also tells you when you go further from the center, that's when you have a higher stresses. Is that clear to everyone? Any questions? So I'm going to move to a different topic here, which is the axis of bending and determine the cross section. Okay? This is, will be in, in two weeks, but I figured out but th this lesson is going to take me a lot, like very long time. So I just tried to take some portion out of it and like distribute it over the other lectures. What's that? Yeah, we, we already finished that lesson. So we are done now. We are done with the torsion. Any question? No question. This axis of bending, what's that? That's the end of the torsion. Yeah, that's the end of exam one. What, uh, let me write, let me make a line here. That's the end. That's the end of exam one. OK? And now it's, tell me. This, uh, this should be. One minute. I do have it. Yeah, I was preparing it. This should be 11. This one. This should be 11. But yeah, but this 11, if you, can, if you look in here, I do have 18 slides. So that's too much, too much. I, I'm, I'm not sure how I'm going to manage this. That's why I'm taking some parts out and like distribute over the lectures. OK? It's easy. So one minute. Yeah, it's easy. It's, it's not that hard. So what I want you to do is for this column, I want you to tell me the cross section and the axis of bending. In different words, when I apply a force of P here, how do you think this column going to bend? Is it fixed at the bottom? Yeah, it's, gonna, it's, it's fixed. It is fixed at the bottom. 
So I do have this column. I applied this force here, and it's fixed at the bottom. So which axis that this thing is bending about? OK, one minute. This is why? It's going to bend like, no, not, it's not going to bend like this in real life. I'm just like exaggerating. But when I apply this force, which axis is bending about? No, Z. Y, it's, it's going to bend like this if it's Y. So always the axis of bending surrounds how it's going to deform. So now it's bending about. So I'm applying a force like here. It's bending about what axis? Of course, it's not going to do like this, but I'm just exaggerating. X axis. If we do have, if we do have an obvious bending moment, you can use your right hand rule as well. How is that? So I know that this force times that distance will give me this moment, right? Right? Force times distance, so it's going to rotate that way, right? Use your right hand rule and make your hand follow the bending moment, and your thumb will point towards the axis of bending. So it was, yeah, it was pointing about x on z. So whoever said x is right. My bad. Yeah, it's going to bend like this, right? About x. So here is x. Do you all see it? So here is x. My bad. Whoever said x, I'm so sorry. OK, I'm so sorry. I'm so sorry. But you all see it, right? I'm convinced and you convinced. OK? So what I want you to do is I want you to tell me what the cross section of this column. And again, when I mention cross section, get your sword out and cut that column. And when you cut it, what are you going to see? What, what is the dimension here? What is the dimension of the cross section? A times, a times B. I don't want to see anyone write H. It's not A times H. It's A times B. So here, what I want you to do, I want you to write A times B. And you all, you all agree, when this column going to rotate like this, it's rotating about the x-axis, right? Anyone not convinced about the x-axis? You see how this is going to rotate? So you have two ways. You can imagine this. So if I'm imagining this, it's going to rotate about the x-axis. Or you can use your right hand. When your finger rotates with the moment, your thumb will point toward the axis of bending. So the axis of bending here is x-axis, right? And x-axis from the 3D, it is parallel to which dimension, A or B? It's parallel to B. So I want to put the axis of bending parallel to B like this. So here is, for example, x-axis. It's OK if I see someone draw the cross-section like this and instead of A times B, B times A. And then here you'll be axis of bending. It's the same thing. It's like a perspective way of how you look into it. OK? So let's take a step by showing you this. So this beam, which axis is going to rotate about? If you don't see an obvious bending moment, that's when you have to imagine this. So I do have a beam. And this force will make the beam rotate like this. Which axis is this beam surrounding? Y. That's correct. So what's the cross section now? So this guy is going to bend like this. Right? So it's bending about the y axis. OK, I want you to draw the cross section and put the, the, the axis of bending in it. Tell me. How come we're not saying that instead of bending, it's like s? Yeah. Bending. I will think about the z axis. It can't be not bending. OK, I will, in the next example, I'll show you how it's going to bend about the z axis. OK? So wait until the next slide, and I will respond to you. OK? But you're convinced about the y-axis? So if I apply the force like this, it's going to bend like that. And I will show you how it's bending like z-axis in a moment. But let, bear with me. So what is the cross-section now? B times t. The y-axis is parallel to which dimension? t. This is the y. Let me move to your part, which is this one. So now I have this beam, and I have so something we call short cantilever or corbel, which what you see here in real life. And when I apply a force in here, 
what is this force going to force, like how it's going to bend the beam? About which axis? You see it? No, this beam. I'm not talking about the column. No. So this beam, this beam is the curve. So I'm not interested in that one. I'm, wanna, I'm interested in how this big beam going to bend. So I'm applying a force in here. So how is this going to make the beam bend? Anyone? You tell me. Z axis. So this one is Z axis. So it's gonna, it, the axis means it's wanted to rotate the beam that way. It's gonna rotate it that way, right? It wanted to, I will exaggerate, but this is how, for example, the beam wanna rotate, right? This, if, if a failure will happen, this beam gonna, ro gonna rotate down. So which axis now? This is the z-axis. Do you all see it or no? Convinced? You're not convinced, right? Why are you not convinced? OK. If you're not convinced, trans like convert this force to a bending moment. So force times that distance, which is force times perpendicular distance, I'm going to have a moment like this, right? Make your hand follow the bending moment, and your thumb will tell you which axis of bending <coughs> for this beam. Do you see it now? So you see it in this way, but you can't imagine this, right? So it's, it's going to rotate that way. Does the beam, go, it's one to, like, it's, it, it's not going to do like this, because that's, that's, that's not real. So it's going to rotate this way, OK? OK. So any of you are not convinced or no? You're not convinced? OK. You're still not convinced? OK, go up. This one? Yeah. yeah. Why are you saying it kind of bends in like that instead of saying the whole section is going to fall over and bend about the y? Because it's fixed at the column here. The column is so stiff to uh, do this allow the structure to go to this side. Well, would you give it up the problem? Like the yeah. Problem? Yeah, yeah, of course, of course. But this is like, I'm, 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 I'm giving this example of axis of bending from like the structure point of view or like my specialization. I have a very stiff column, very stiff. So the column, so if I don't have the column, and I do have a force, the, be the force will take the beam just like forever, OK? So I do have a very fixed column that this allow the beam to move at the end, OK? You all see it or no? Tell me. This one? This one I haven't yet said. But like, yeah, you tell me. Which axis this thing is bending about? That's correct. It's x-axis. So this beam, so if I have this beam, and I do have a force in the middle, and again, this thing, the two columns, prevent the beam from falling. So which axis is bending about now? X-axis. What's that? Oh, yeah. Tell me now the cross-section. Which cross-section? It's B times T still. OK, so where we draw the, the axis of bending? So I do have b times t. What is the x-axis? Which dimension that the x-axis is parallel to? b, right? So I will put the x-axis here parallel to the b. Where is the torsion part? So this torsion guy, I still have bt. But the axis of bending is z. So I'm, I'm drawing it as a dot here. And I'm going to say z axis. OK? Any questions about the axis of bending? You all good? Like this guy, the short cantilever? We are not interested in that. So the length, because the length is parallel to z. But it has nothing to do with the length. It's always the cross-section. It's always how to detect the cross-section. OK? Any questions? Where is the which one? That one? So that one is a practice for you to tell me. So that one, you can come to and show it to me tomorrow. 
I want you to take a cross section of the column and the beam and tell me what is the cross section for the column and beam and the axis of bending for both of them. So I want you to end up with giving me two cross sections, give me the dimensions and the axis of bending. So this is like an exercise for you. Okay? So if you have any question, you can come you can come over now. <laughs> 